Guiding is sending corrections through a telescope mount to keep it centered on an object. Before the joys of computer control, guiding was done by pressing buttons while looking through an attached guide scope. The very first astrophotos were taken in this manner, with an assistant sometimes guiding for a whole night long. Now, connecting everything to a computer allows for automatic guiding, auto-guiding in short. The most commonly used program for this is PHD2, a free software which does a trick really well. Although this is easier than manual guiding, you will still have to direct the program by adjusting settings to optimize it for auto-guiding your setup. I will first go over a hardware checkup to make sure your rig is ready for guiding. After this, I will go over the software and how to use PHD2. Starting with the telescope mount, your mount's carrying capacity needs to be higher than your telescope setup weighs. This is to ensure that you are not straining your mount, giving better guiding results. Balancing the mount is important to good guiding. Perfectly balancing your mount may seem the best way to go, but some people suggest leaving your mount in an east heavy position in the northern hemisphere and west heavy in the southern. This is to keep the tracking gears engaged at all times, reducing backlash, also known as gear slack. Of course, you will also need to be precisely polar aligned. You can get off by being only roughly aligned as the guiding will correct it, but it will be less accurate and you will start to suffer from field rotation. Now for the telescope. The most crucial thing is to minimize wobble. This wobble can be caused by a multitude of things. A sloppy focuser tube, a too thin dovetail plate and many more. Try to move parts of your setup to check for any wobble. For Newtonians, there are two additional problems to worry about. Tube flexure and wind. When you have a 10 inch Newtonian tube, for example, it will act as a big wind sail. This pushing will affect your guiding. To prevent this, image somewhere enclosed by walls when it's windy, or even set up a windscreen yourself. Tube flexure is when the tube of the telescope flexes due to the weight of the camera, or even by its own weight. This flexure does not need to be large to impact your guiding, as even less than a millimeter of movement will result in trailing at high zoom. The problem in this is that your guide scope will not correct for it, as it is a separate scope that does not experience the flexure. There are two ways to fix this. The first is to spread out the tube rings and mounting another dovetail plate on top of it to sandwich the telescope. This helps, but does not always fix it entirely. Another solution is to use an off-axis guider. This is a guider that attaches in front of your camera with a mechanism that gets some of the light from the telescope. Due to this guider using the main telescope also, it will correct for the flexure. You will need a guide scope that has enough focal length for your main telescope. Here's a handy rule of thumb. 150 to 200 millimeters is enough for focal lengths up to 2000 millimeters. From here, you will need either an off-axis guider or a bigger guide scope. Most importantly, a guide scope must not be able to wobble in relation to the telescope, otherwise you will receive trailing. This can either lie in the mounting system or the attachment to the guide camera. I used a 3D printed adapter which had significant wobble and replacing it with the proper one fixed up my training. Focus is also important of course, so test out if your setup can reach focus as well. The guide camera. The main thing to worry about here is sensitivity. Depending on the f-stop of your guide scope or main telescope if you are using an off-axis guider, your sensitivity must be enough to pick out stars. Monochrome guide cams are the most sensitive so these can be used with off-axis guiders or high f-ratio guide scopes. Color cameras are less sensitive. I use a color camera to guide nevertheless because I also use it as a planetary camera. Next important thing to consider is USB speed. USB 3 cameras will transfer data much faster than USB 2 variants, meaning that you can do shorter exposure times. However, with auto guiding, you will not need exposure times less than one or two seconds. USB 2 cameras do however drop some frames, which can be a nuisance. Luckily, most cameras you buy today are USB 3. Just to be sure, double check before purchase. That brings us to the final part, cables. To connect your guide camera, you will not need the ST4 cable that came with it. Both the camera and the mount must go directly to the computer. 
I do this by using a USB hub and an extension cable. Again, they must be USB 3. Using the SD4 cable will not allow PHD to see what the mount's position is in, which can be problematic. A lot of people when they get their guide camera, it comes with a guide cable. And you've got an SD port on your mount as well, so why wouldn't you connect the two together? Of course, wrong. What you should do is grab the cable, pour some explosives on it, and destroy it. Software. After you have downloaded PHD2, you will start on this screen. Welcome to PHD2. In the bottom left corner of your screen, you will see a cable icon. Press this icon and a connect screen will show up. Here you must first create a new profile to save your equipment in. Then you must select your mount and guide camera and connect them. To start the camera, you must press this button called the loop button. Change your exposure until you can see stars. Change your screen's brightness with this slider. You can use this live view to focus also. In the brain tab, go to guiding. Here you must enter your guide scope's focal length. Calibrating. Now, slew to the rough portion of sky where you will be imaging. When your mount stops slewing, you can start calibrating your guiding. To do this, you must first select any star. I always select them manually, as PHD occasionally selects hot pixels. When you have a star selected, press the green disc to begin the calibration process. This might take some time, and be sure not to shift your mount or telescope during this process. When the calibration is complete, you will automatically begin guiding. You might receive some error messages. They can be ignored, but they do help getting better guiding results, by better understanding what is going on. For me, a more precise polar alignment usually helps prevent error messages. The settings. Now that you are guiding, you will have to tweak the settings. Be prepared to spend several nights trying to nail these down. In the bottom left corner of the screen, you will see a couple of letters, numbers and boxes. The boxes are only to adjust visuals, like the scale of the graph, the colors, etc. Below that you will find two checkboxes. Trend lines indicate in which direction an axis is drifting on the graph. This is an average, forming a straight line. Trend lines predict where a graph is going to drift to. It is a straight line and usually your guiding will follow that line. Corrections will show you in what direction and how aggressively PHD is correcting. Below, you will find the important stuff. These numbers indicate how accurate your guiding is. RA and DEC are short for right ascension and declination of your mount. The numbers beside them are how much the stars are moving in arc seconds. The TOT, short for total, error, is the main focus. This needs to be less arc seconds than your setup can resolve, to keep the trailing below the pixel level, so that it does not show up in your images. A rule of thumb here is to aim for 0.70 guiding or lower, but below 0.90 is a good start. You won't get this first time however, I went from 1.50 to 0.30 in less than 10 seconds. In this section at the bottom are all the settings. The best way to find the best settings is simply by trying out a lot of different combinations. Trial and error. This button, AGR, short for aggressiveness, is how much of the calculated adjustment it will perform. A high aggressiveness, usually fitting for a slow and heavy setup, can cause overcorrecting in smaller setups. This will cause a sort of fluctuation of the graph. Undercorrection, of course, is also not to be wished for, so don't put the aggressiveness too low. Again, try and see what works best. This, short for hysteresis, is how much of the previous correction will be applied. This will smooth out the graph. I do not adjust this very often and keep it at default. Minmo, short for minimal movement, is how much the star needs to move for it to correct it. 
keep it on the default in the beginning and maybe bring the number down when your guiding gets more accurate. Then we have max RA and max deck. This is how long a guide correction can last at maximum. I leave it at around the default. If it's important to keep the max RA and deck measured in milliseconds lower than your exposure time or it will not have finished the correction before calculating a new one. This is why I'd recommend going with, with an exposure time higher than 2.5 seconds. For the rest of the settings, including those under the brain icon, I recommend leaving them at their defaults for now. I am also still experimenting with these, but, but I tend to get good results while leaving them untouched. This graph represents all the corrections and how much your stars are drifting. The flatter your line is, depending of course on the scale of your graph, the better. To the right here you will see in red a number. This is how sharp the star is. A lower number is a sharper star. Another reason to not get an exposure lower than 2.5 seconds because otherwise it will correct for seeing conditions. These are turbulences with the stars, meaning that it is not a tracking error but an atmosphere error and you cannot correct for that. Hopefully this tutorial will have helped you master the basics of auto guiding. This video alone does not cover it all though. A lot of self experimenting and tweaking settings will get you there. To help as much as I can, I have linked a very detailed graph manual of PHD2 in the description below, where most graph shapes you typically get are explained, and how you might go about correcting them. I wish you all the best of luck in your auto guiding endeavor, one step closer to mastering deep sky astro imaging. Thanks for listening, until next time.